All right, so um, my name is Thomas Steiner. You can find me as Tomayak uh, on the internet, Mastodon, Twitter, what, whatever you want. So just search for Tomayak and will, you will find your social network of choice if you're interested. I'm from the Google, Google Chrome team, and today I want to talk about um, toward making opaque web content more accessible. And um, I'm going back, uh, way back to Adobe Flash until today with Canvas rendered applications. So to first understand what even is opaque web content, you need to understand what is the accessibility tree. And um, luckily in um, Chrome DevTools, you can just uh, press this little accessibility icon here, and then you can see the accessibility tree for example.com in this case. So you can see um, it's a breakdown of there's a heading, there's a paragraph, there's yet another paragraph, and in this paragraph there's a link and so on. So you can very clearly understand um, abstracted away from the design, what is the structure of the page? And this is exactly what is going to be exposed to assistive te technologies like uh, screen readers, for example. So what is then opaque content? Well, opaque web content is something that is in this tree, but not really in a useful way. So you can see I've highlighted the image here. And you can see, well, it says there's an image, but yeah, there's nothing about this image. So if you are a screen, re screen reader user, you're out of the game at this uh, point. Um, you can make this useful by providing alt text. So here, um, I've an annotated this with uh, Yana logo. So you can see, well, now it does make sense. Um, how this works, of course, is in the uh, source code. So if you have an image tag, you can provide an alt uh, attribute. And this gives the ad accessibility tree some more insights into what's happening there. And um, yeah, images have an alt attribute. And um, you may not know this, but this was in HTML2. So from the early days on, they thought about this particular use case. So you can see this is the HTML2 spec. Um, another type of opaque web content are videos and audios, but they have subtitles and captions. So if you look at MDN, the MDN docs for um, videos, you can see there's access accessibility concerns even. And I'm going back to the HTML5 spec. Um, this was also mentioned right there, so people um, could understand, well, if you have a video, you can have a track. And in this track, you can provide subtitles, you can provide um, audio descriptions, and so on. So you can make this more accessible. So why am I mentioning this? Well, because um, this is not what I'm going to talk about. This is opaque web content too, but because we have um, the alt attribute, because we have the track element, it doesn't really make super much sense to dive into this more. The things I want to dive into are, in historical order, Adobe Flash, HTML5 Canvas, and then Canvas rendered applications. And I've taken Flutter as one of the example frameworks that does this. So let's start with Flash. Flash, you may remember it from Flash games. So this is, uh, you can see uh, from the uh, screenshot here, um, Osama bin Laden. So you can very clearly probably uh, put this in a, a time uh, race. So this is 2001, um, right after 9-11. Um, the web was all crazy about uh, Osama bin Laden uh, killing games and stuff. So um, this is a, web a website screenshot that I took today. So today, you can still run Flash thanks to WebAssembly. Um, so someone built uh, a WebAssembly interpreter for Flash. So you can now still um, enjoy this if you want to. So this is actually uh, working today. Um, and people probably also have fond memories, or not so fond memories, of Flash intros, and especially Flash intros on restaurant sites. <laughs> so very, very infamous uh, yeah, how people use Flash. Um, and then Flash, well, essentially it was killed by um, Steve Jobs. So Steve Jobs published uh, his thoughts on Flash. And um, it's all linked in the paper, so if you want to follow up, uh, it's a very interesting read. Um, so yeah, Steve Jobs essentially killed Flash. But um, I want to talk about accessibility um, with Flash. And um, there was a document at the W3C called Flash Techniques for WCAG, uh, WCAG, or whatever. I'm, I'm not really sure how to pronounce it. So WCAG. Um, so WCAG 2.0. And um, it had a number of um, techniques how you could make uh, Flash content more accessible. And um, this is like, if you go back, um, this is uh, a long, long time ago that this was published. Um, I don't see the year uh, on the document, but um, we can probably find it out. So um, anyways, this is um, yeah making Flash 2 as a recommendation here, for example, to set the description property for non-text objects in Flash so people can make sense of it. Um, Flash 3 is a technique of marking up 
uh, more objects in Flash so that they can be ignored by AT. So that's kind of important too. So not everything actually needs to be exposed to um, um, assistive technologies. It also had um, the tab index property, so you could um, specify the logical tab order um, in Flash. Um, this was Flash 15. Flash 20, rescanning of Flash components to provide highly visible focus indication. So contrast, high contrast mode in Windows, this is something they had way back then when um, Flash was uh, all the rage. And then of course, uh, labeling form controls um, by setting accessible names, this was Flash 25. Something that's very interesting is actually Flash 34, using screen reader detection to turn off sounds that play automatically. So interestingly, um, Flash and ActionScript um, exposed Flash accessibility, accessibility active property. And with this, you could see as a developer if the user was using um, a screen reader. Um, I'm not sure who of you is uh, deeply into um, the accessibility community, but exposing that someone is read uh, using a screen reader is commonly very frowned upon. So people don't like to be exposed as being uh, dependent on these technologies. Um, but here, Flash had it with probably good, ex uh, good intentions. So again, this was very, very long time ago. So the web was a more innocent place back then. Um, the idea there was uh, really, yeah, you want to turn off sounds that play automatically if someone is using a screen reader as one of the use cases that was given. And um, this hooked into Windows APIs. Well, this microphone is horrible. Thank you. Um, this hooked into Windows APIs, so um, if you were on Windows using a screen reader, um, this would get exposed. Um, here's an example in ActionScript how you would set um, the description of, uh, in this case, a chart. So you could have chart.accessibility properties, you create a new accessibility properties object, and then you can set the name, and then you can set the description. So it makes a lot of sense, so just a, um, a description of what the screen reader user should describe this content actually depicts for um, um, yeah, people who can, who can see. Next, I want to talk about Canvas, HTML5 Canvas. So what do you people use Canvas for? Well, obviously games, so here is a very simple one. Um, it's Canvas rendered, and you can see the accessibility tree of this game, so it's nothing. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's all ignored content because yeah, there's nothing that the screen reader can, can see here. Um, this is a very, very um, horrible example, but it's actual, actually true. So <laughs> if you use Facebook um, and you have a sponsored post, Facebook renders the word sponsored in a canvas so that it makes ad blocking a lot harder. It's not impossible, but it makes it a lot, a lot harder. So boy, I, I, hate, I hate them for doing that, but yeah, <laughs> here we are. Um, that's the not so innocent web of today. Um, and ironically, I am being shown an ad for Google ads on Facebook. So. Anyways, <laughs> uh, as a Google employee, that, that's kind of funny. Um, but yeah, so that's a way people use Canvas too to prevent ad blocking. Um, and Canvas can obviously be also used as an actual canvas. So this is a screenshot of Photoshop running in the web. And um, in Photoshop, you have a canvas, like in a, in a quite literal sense, where you can have your drawing, your picture that you create with the application. So that's a canvas in HTML too. Um, what the HTML5 spec said on Canvas was the following. Authors should not use the Canvas element in a document when a more suitable element is available, which makes sense. For example, it is inappropriate to use Canvas to render a page heading. So people should rather instead use an H1, which again makes a lot of sense. So this is what the HTML5 spec said. A lot of people discussed the accessibility of uh, Canvas in wikis at the W3C. So um, they are still preserved. The Canvas Accessibility Use Cases Wiki um, identified challenges like hit testing, magnification, explorability, and dynamic focus. So if you want to get all those things with a Canvas, you have to program them by hand. So there's no mouse over, for example, if you render a button in a Canvas, you need to make this mouse over hit testing and so on logic all by yourself. Um, the added element Canvas Wiki, so it was named like that, um, tracked Canvas, uh, Canvas element accessibility issues and questions. And um, it listed reasons why or why not um, accessibility provision should be exposed on the Canvas. So for example, it said native accessible, accessible Canvas would provide a person with disabilities equal opportunity, which makes sense. But then on the other end, it said an accessibility solution for Canvas is not needed. It is a usage problem, solvable through education and evangelism. So, ah, 
maybe, maybe not. Um, further, the document also said um, the following. So specifying an accessibility API for Canvas itself, expanding on the DOM concept with ARIA and support for platform accessibility APIs would make sense. And I agree. Um, fallbacks based on short or long text, so what we have seen with Flash, obviously also makes sense in Canvas. And then it said adding a warning to the spec for reasons not to use Canvas would also make sense. Or using metadata like ARIA role application or RDFA um, to describe semantically what is happening on the Canvas would make sense as well. Um, the HTML5 or HTML living standard rather, so we stopped versioning HTML, now it's a living standard. And now in the living standard, um, it says the following. For example, it actively discourages authors from implementing text editing controls using the Canvas element and instead recommends using the input element, the text area element, or the content editable attribute. So there's this warning that the uh, wiki spoke about. Now it's in the HTML living standard. Um, what few people know, but what is actually also very much specified, is you can have child elements inside of a canvas as alternative um, contact, uh, content. So you can see here, um, there's this um, shape um, canvas with, uh, yeah, it has a heading, it has uh, various shapes. And then inside, as you can see this down here, inside of the canvas nested, there's um, a P element and an anchor uh, tag. So there's the heading. And this also gets exposed as uh, the uh, accessible content on the accessibility tree. So it's very little known that you can do this because most people just have a, an empty canvas, but you can put HTML in there and this makes um, this then more accessible for screen reader users or just in general users of um, assistive technologies. Um, there was a thing called, or still is, the accessibility object model. And the idea there was, um, how can we convey the semantics of something? So in this case, um, it allowed you to um, attach an accessible root, and then you had an accessible root with a new accessible node object that you could create. And then you could give this table, in this case, a role of, say, table. Then you could say the call count, so the column count of this table is 10, the row count is 100. You could append um, a header row, which would be another accessible node, and so on. So you get the point, you sort of construct this um, element tree of accessible nodes. Um, the only problem is eh, it's deprecated already. So one of the biggest problems with this proposal was that it fired events when people were using those virtual nodes. So again, it was exposing that someone was using assistive technology, which again, isn't great. Um, yeah, screen reader users don't want to be exposed on the web. Like, I spoke to, to some and they said, it's one of the few places where I'm not immediately giving away that I'm blind or that I'm needing help. Um, I can be anonymous on the web and be treated like everyone else. Um, but yeah, if you get exposed by this technology, yeah, it's over with anonymity and people don't want that. Lastly, I want to talk about canvas rendered applications. And um, I said Flutter is one of the examples, but um, here's an idea. So you can see um, that's a design, material design uh, demo application. Um, let me just go one slide further. So you can see here it has buttons, it has, um, I don't know, action items, it has um, sub menus and so on. And um, if you look at this, the entire thing is just a canvas. So there's some uh, custom elements, but it, essentially the entire application is rendered on a canvas. One minute left? OK, I'll be quick. But we started a bit late, right? Okay. I'll be super quick. Um, so if you look at this um, in the accessibility tree, you can see there's an, a button exposed that says Enable Accessibility. So when you click this button, all of a sudden um, the uh, accessibility tree gets enriched. So now, um, despite this being rendered entirely on the canvas, once you click this button, um, you can see that all the buttons um, in the application get exposed as actual buttons. Um, so you can see um, this sort of is connected. And um, if you um, yeah, make the association, what is actually behind this, you can see that it is an uh, FLT semantics node that has a role of buttons. You can see that here. It has a tab index and so on. So it's made look like a button without actually being one, but to assistive technology, it gets exposed as such, thanks to ARIA. Um, Flutter is just one example, but here is also uh, QT. So QT framework, um, they have this pizza menu demo application, and you can see again the uh, canvas here. So this pizza thing, it's just an empty canvas. 
We have Kotlin Wasm, who have composed multi-platform, which is the thing that people use to build Android applications that can now be compiled to the web. And again, it's an empty canvas. So you can see um, people build canvas rendered applications, but they all have this big, big problem. Um, there's for Rust, the eGuy um, yeah, GUI framework. Again, it's an empty application, but you can see here, it's super rich to sighted users. But again, if you are yeah, dependent on accessibility features, you are out of luck. Um, there's one approach called Access Kit that people have created, um, where the idea, idea is essentially to take this um, approach from Flutter, which is this, um, we create a hidden DOM tree for um, assistive technology. And um, by making this just regular DOM, it's not accessibility um, nodes like before with the AOM, with the accessibility, accessibility object model, but um, just regular DOM nodes. So um, you get all the um, yeah, positive aspects, but without all the downsides. So forward-looking history, and I, I made this up yesterday, will AI save us? So here we have um, a canvas rendered application and you have some seeing AI and um, it says, oh, scrollable list with um, a bunch of items. So it can't see how many items are there because well, there's something going on there. Once you scroll down, it can say, oh, okay, now I know. It's a scrollable list item with uh, 15 items. Um, but on the other hand, there's code behind this. So there's the Flutter code that built this application. So you can imagine um, a coding AI. So it would see that this code block state carrot glasses has 15 items that creates a scrollable list and so on. So you could imagine the two, can I just very quickly finish? Um, you can imagine the two um, AIs working together, a seeing AI, a coding AI. So maybe AI might save us here, um, but it's very easy to create um, content that is not accessible. So here, um, there's a line chart example. So it renders everything to a canvas. But the good thing again is um, AI is good at tedious tasks. So you can just throw this AI, uh, this image at an AI and have the AI analyze the picture. And it's actually really good. So I did this yesterday with uh, GPT-4O, uh, the new one. And um, you get alt text that is really, really good and describes what a human being would interpret from looking at this chart. So Conclusions, opaque web content existed almost since the beginning of the web. That's a problem worth solving because the web is for everyone. The opposite of good is meaning well. So don't make assumptions about how people want to use um, your page with assistive technology. Just build a great web page and people can then use it. AI might save us sometimes, but it's complex. So it's definitely not magic pixie dust. And ironically, not using opaque web content might be the simplest solution in the first place. If you want to follow up, the paper is at uh, goo.gle, so goo.google uh, slash opac web content dash paper, and the slides are at dash slides. Thank you very much for listening.